you hear me? Is it turned on? <laughs> right, you can hear me. Oh, I'm saying bad there. So I just want to start by thanking to move it down by thanking the, the president and also the society for having me here. And what I'm going to try and do during the next hour or so is go on a journey in my research and also this big question about how maybe we can synthesize life. So this is a this is also a work in progress in the lab. This is not an overview of a past event. This is going on at the moment. So this is really science in motion, I guess. That's at least the objective. Um, so this is up here. I'm just showing, going to show you lots of different chemistry sets as we go through the lecture. But what I want to try and do is, is get, get the balance between the chemistry lesson, because I love giving chemistry lessons or stimulating people to think about chemistry, but really to look at the wider issues about what really life is. Is it relevant to even try and define it? What does it mean to actually make life? And what are the consequences if we do it? And I think that science, scientists, policy makers and so on are actively nowadays trying to think about the Manhattan Project before they do the Manhattan Project and actually then blog it and talk about it. And this is part of the effort to, to have this because I think that the world we're in now people are smart, well-educated, and it's worth having the discussion before we go and, and make the grey goo, as Prince Charles uh, worries about. Now, I, I, I guess I see myself as a bit of a creationist, because I'm a chemist and I like to make molecules. <laughs> but of course, evolution, here's God, or someone in a white dressing gown. <laughs> but he's a chemist, or she, depending on your, on your uh, persuasion. And the idea that evolution is a fundamental driving force in our scientific reality, in, our, in the way we look at the world, is interesting, particularly when chemists want to do this. In fact, those of you that have taken drugs or need some medicine of some description, or in fact use any chemical, will have invariably had a chemical that was put there through this creationist process. Now, I don't mean creationist as in the kind of religion versus science, but I mean a chemist writing down a molecular formu for formula, designing that molecule, making the molecule, and then successfully deploying that molecule. Sometimes to great effect, sometimes to great disaster. But there is this interesting thing where design and evolution are beginning to come together. And part of the subtext for the talk tonight is to really ask a question about is there a new way of doing science that abandons design but uses evolution with a well-controlled specification? And there are a series of questions that I want to highlight as I go through the talk during the next hour or so. But first of all, let's, let's go to this special theory of evolution. Um, and I think the question is what best put as it is up here on the screen, which is, I'd like to ask you all a question, which is, what is the most basic unit of matter that can undergo Darwinian evolution that you know of. And I suppose it won't be much of a surprise to, to see that it's a cell. And here's a bacterial cell. This is some E. coli. And this is kind of, if you look at what's going on here, this looks fascinating because you have this food, this broth, but from that first few cells, over a relatively short space of time, that bacteria grew and divided until they consumed the screen. And this is the process of life. Yet, so many billion years into life on planet Earth, we, have, we, are, we are locked into life based upon biology, organic chemistry. So one of the questions I wanted to ask as an inorganic chemist was, is this unique? Can we go beyond the special theory of evolution that just works in biology? Is there something more? And if there isn't, what is it about this stuff that's so special? So we win either way, but it's an interesting question to think about this because this will be coming back again and again during the talk for us to think about what life really is, even if it's relevant to define life. And when I'm giving lectures to my undergraduates, I sometimes wonder um, <laughs> if some of them are alive. <laughs> so what are the important questions that we think about when we're thinking about um, evolution and life? What is life? Is biology special? Is matter evolvable? Now, put in that general sense, it seems like nonsense is matter evolvable. But if you look at bacteria and the tree of life, as I'll present later, you can see that life, in fact, uh, matter, is evolvable. 
So I guess the question could be rephrased. Is all matter have the, does all matter have the potential to be evolved in a, this way? So this then leads us to the question, can we make open platforms for synthetic life? And of course, what are the ethical and societal issues? And I would really encourage you, and it's, I'm pretty, you know, I gave a lecture at TED last year, and that was pretty nervous, I was pretty nervous. I can say I'm a little bit more nervous now. Maybe it's the fact that you're all, you know, you're quite educated, and you're going to be smarter than I am. And you might be able to really ask some important questions here. And so this is one of the reasons why we're doing, while I'm very, um, um, I would say, excited to try and present the science in motion. Because this isn't done. This isn't dusted. This hasn't even really begun yet. I have ambitions to do it quite, quite, in quite a short space of time. And then, if we manage it, the question is, are we alone in the universe, starts to be answered. Because if I can make life in my lab, based upon inorganic stuff, then perhaps this could happen elsewhere, and we can look at the process that defines this feature, this emergent property, perhaps, of matter, life. So we could tell NASA what to go look for. Or we could just go look on our doorstep and look again and go, oh my gosh, that was alive the entire time. And it re changes the way we look at things. But perhaps most interestingly, if we sort out these issues, then what will the new technologies come from? And I'll talk about making hybrid bionic cells. Take a living cell that's damaged and add on a bionic cell you developed using this artificial biology and improve it somehow. Now, I think that's both exciting and terrifying in equal measure. And it's really interesting to explore at least what could be the positives of that. But what are the specific important questions? Well, first of all, is evolution a tendency or property of matter? Is evolution, it, does it even deserve a name in this sense? Is it like um, the theory of the universe, what, the Big Bang, the, f the forces we find in nature? Or is it just a tendency? Can we engineer or discover non-biological systems capable of evolution? So that's a very important question that we have. And then can we engineer minimal units, minimal robots, chemical systems, capable of autonomous assembly, adaptation, selection, and propagation. And these are very important words that I will come back to. And when I show you the chemistry, and I apologize for those of you that hated high school chemistry um, for it, but hopefully I'll, I will make the, the, the important points really clear. And of course, there's lots of time for questions. And if you can even make out my email address down here, there's plenty of time. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of time for email as well. So synthetic life or inorganic life is, uh, is quite interesting. Star Trek already did this. You know, there was this famous lie when it says it's life, Jim, but not as we know it. And that is kept in my head. Can we really make life, Jim, but not as we know it? And um, in Star Trek, it was this very friendly looking silicon blob that was being made extinct for whatever reason. And in the Terminator, we had these liquid mercury robots running around. <coughs> Now, this is not life, because these are not Darwinian evolvable. These were machines, by the way, and perhaps this is life. So this goes back to this question about the Terminator is about a manufactured object that goes around, and lots of people have reported on my work have talked about the Terminator problem. And I think maybe that's more of an understanding issue, but I'd be more worried about Mr. Silicon here. So what do we mean by life? That's a question that comes again and again and again. And of course, if we think about the universe, the position of carbon in the periodic table, put on a star here, just in case uh, you want to know where carbon is. Hopefully that is carbon, not something else. <laughs> if you think about the universe, how large the universe is, how many elements are on the periodic table, it seems fascinating that life on planet Earth, the key element is carbon. So I want to ask one important question. Is carbon essential for this thing that we term life? Uh, because if it isn't, then we need to redefine the, how we go and look for life in the universe. And perhaps we can redefine the biohazard term to looking, saying, well, be careful. If all matter can become alive, you better watch out, because maybe it's not just you know, biological viruses. There will be inorganic viruses. 
So when it comes to thinking about life in the universe, we know how old the universe is according to co the, sta the current status of cosmology, and we, we think about life. But people, a lot of thinkers used to suggest that life was incredibly improbable and we were this fundamentally wonderful accident that happened if you're on the science side and if you're on the religious side, of course, you know, you, you didn't have to worry about this improbability. Now, I'm not really... I'm not really worried about the nature of the religious versus science debate because I think that's not appropriate here. But what I think is interesting is to think about how life could arise from nothing. Are we this f fantastically improbable? Or are we, as I'm going to argue today, um, so, so ubiquitous, it's, it's, it's fascinating that there is life everywhere and not just on Goldilocks-like planets that we term Earth. And how would we go and find it? How would we look for that life? So really, that we're going from this to cell, cell division in the universe is a fantastically wonderful thing. And if, if, um, if I get the chance to kind of really get it across to my kids how incredible science is, you can study this and you can study this, but we can't link the two. We have no idea. We can engineer the cell. We can do all sorts of wonderful things with biology. We even think we know where this came from, but we have no idea about the origin of life. Zero. Now just think about that for a second. We've spent all this money on cosmology, all this money on biology, but we don't even know how the chemistry that put us here has got here. And so when you start to doubt my, the ludicrous nature of the talk as we go on this evening, just remember that at some point you came from nothing or no biology, from inorganic chemistry. Because per definition, before biology, before organic chemistry, it could only be inorganic. Now I'm not arguing against carbon, you could be carbon. But there's a very nice um, separation in chemistry in the literature that goes back to vitalism where er all things organic were termed biological. So it's more of a play on words. I'm not excluding carbon altogether because I don't know. But let's ask what life is. Life is featured by very complex reaction networks. Here's a cell, lots of metabolism outlined, nucleotide, nucleotide biosynthesis, um, phospholipid biosynthesis, transcription going on all the time, protein synthesis going on all the time. A cell is a, is a, is a compartment in which many, many different interconnected chemical reactions are occurring simultaneously. And it has inbuilt redundancy. So there's some very interesting features about cells that we could learn for our own society. That basically if one fuel source is turned off, another metabolism, metabolic pathway gets turned on. You, can't, you don't just need to eat one type of food. You can eat many types of food. So biology is adaptive. Just think about if we can make a technology that could adapt and use certain raw materials from the environment according to the pollution and, and help use some universal energy source, the sun, to clear up our environment. So that's one of the potential uses you can start to think about if you can make artificial living systems. But also life is characterized by this vitalism, this, this fact that you, you burn fuel and you're warm and you dissipate energy. And in the process of that energy dissipation, your cells divide, you grow, and that you are able to think and do things. And we still do not really understand this gap between energy and living systems. Too hot, and there is no sophistication for order for life, too cold and nothing happens. So there's clearly a very interesting boundary between life and non-life defined by the dissipation of energy. And so there is this thing in physics, what I was discussing earlier, that in physics, we don't really understand why physics is not um, uh, irreversible as written on the page. Some physicists would argue it is irreversible. But there is no, the arrow of time in our universe comes from the second law which comes from chemistry. So there is a gap in entropy between physics and chemistry and there's a gap between chemistry and biology because we don't know how the hell we got to biology. So I wonder if those two problems are connected. And maybe by doing this research, we will start to be able to tease that apart. What is it about physics that connects the arrow of time, the fact we're here, there's time at all, and what is it in chemistry that can give rise to biology? 
And so Darwin mused that life arose on planet Earth in a warm little pond somewhere, and that's not such a nonsense idea. But how did it arise? I don't see life arising in the warm little pond I have in my backyard spontaneously. Well, actually, I do. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's because it came from life already there, and spontaneous generation doesn't occur. And, and so we're going back in time, because for many years there were lots of discussion, particularly from Pasteur and Lister, about spontaneous generation. Bacteria can come from nothing. Well, that was clearly shown to be false. And there's some beautiful um, experiments done where sterilized air was taken from different uh, um, 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 altitudes and the presence of that bacteria interrogated. And so what I'm advocating is actually that we do get spontaneous um, formation of life. And we need, to, we need to understand how that is so. So to think about that, we need to really think, put in context for the time. Because most people say, well, number one, life is fan fantastically impossible. We are so improbable. We are such a miracle. It's a fluke. And the, the, then you look at the age of planet Earth. And planet Earth, Earth is about four and a half billion years. But then when you look in the fossil record, well, actually, we have evidence of life four billion years ago. So we have four and a half billion years of life, three billion years of photosynthesis, one billion years of multicellular life, and 200,000 years of humans. So there is a lot of stuff going on in here. So life arose quite quickly in planetary terms, basically as soon as it was cold enough um, and maybe the, the meteoric bombardment had ceased. So what happened in, the, in the, those half a billion years? And this is the quest that I'm going to talk to you about in this talk. So let's, let's all become creationists. And again, I don't want to get into a religious debate here, but it's really interesting just to think about probability. Because the number one reason that people give you that, um, that life, and it actually it's so nonsense, it's not even worth discussing, but it serves an argument, a scientific argument I want to give you that's really interesting for me. So the, the idea is put forward that biology could not spontaneously arise because it's just fantastically improbable and you can't make proteins through evolution. And we've got, a, now forget the details of this calculation here unless you're really, you really want it, but just take polypeptide with 101 amino acids, 100 linkages. And then if you look at the configurational probability of that, it's really quite small. And in fact, K, the, the equilibrium constant for this is 10 to the minus 338. Um, uh, zero to you and I. <laughs> so, oh my God, proteins can't spontaneously exist. That's terrible. That means life couldn't arise in the universe. Well, let's go to a cluster, an inorganic molecule, which I'll show you in a minute. I make this in my lab every day. You could make it. Anyone here could make it. No problem. And this cluster has these units. It has 14 units which have seven connections, 98 units which have six connections, 28 units which have five connections, and 14 units with four connections. This is scaffolding holding the atoms together. Overall, it has 882 linkages. Have you tried doing 882 factorial? I did it on Mathematica today. I couldn't even get to the calculation. The probability is zero in an infinite, infinite number of universes. Yet, when I take a flask in my lab and I put in a chemical called sodium molybdate, it's just a, a salt of molybdenum, and I add in some reducing agent and ascorbic acid, some electrons, and some acid, some lemon juice, what I get in about 100 milliseconds is exactly this, a cluster, a wheel, you see it turning, with 882 atoms connected. Now, again, I didn't see the hand of anyone there other than me putting it together. Now, um, I'm kind of ignoring one fact, and one fact I want to show you, share with you, and that is random processes don't give life. Some kind of evolu evolutionary process gave life. And how did that occur? There was no evolution there. Well, in chemistry, we have the periodic table and there's a rule book down there which says, oh, no, you can't have just any number of bonds. You have to have a prescription. And actually, this prescription is controlled by the laws of physics and quantum mechanics. And in my lab a few years ago, we were able to work out the mechanism for the making of this wheel. This is a simulation of what goes on in the solution. All these building blocks coming together, coalescing, 
we in, we put a template which forms, which naturally forms very quickly. The wheel forms and kicks out the template. We published this paper. In fact, it was when I was quite young and, and desperate to kind of get into general journals and this flew into science. I couldn't believe it. And it was put on the front cover because and having an inorganic molecule on the front cover of science when normally there are dinosaurs or aliens or something <laughs> is, was really for me a, a, a nice touch. But what I would like to draw your attention here is to this red thing. This red thing is a, is, it's a molybdenum atom in the center, and they're oxygens. But you can see the connection, this triangle here. These connections are put there by the periodic table. It's a non-random process. There are rules. And when you have rules, you get order. And so for me, although I'm not ba creationist bashing per se, I'm trying to show that the probability, it, it, it's an, actually a realistic question to ask. But when you think about the non-random nature, something beautiful happens. And so what I'm trying to say in the context of this lecture is maybe there are some rules in inorganic chemistry that give rise to some order that eventually gives rise to biology. And I want to kind of put a road map in front of us that we can go down. So that brings us to the origin of life. Intelligent design, direct and indirect, or emergence of chemical complexity um, to biology. So the primordial soup here, this is a good source of 20 amino acids apparently, or we have ET. And so the ET is not a relevant issue here because it's just doing what the Europeans are doing right now with deficit, we're trying to pass it on to someone else. It's like, <laughs> it's almost like playing musical chairs, right? And everyone's like trying to get Germany to not be left out. But anyway, I will talk about evolution in the European Union later and I mean that in a really serious context. So we have the, this two kind of suggestions that someone intelligent put us there and that's not a stupid suggestion um, because I can imagine humankind trying to put synthetic life into the cosmos to survive beyond planet Earth um, being consumed by the sun. Because we're not all going to get in a rocket and wander off. The only way we're going to tell anyone we were ever here is perhaps by seeding the cosmos. So it's not so silly. But I'm hoping at some point life had to come from nothing. Because otherwise we were one big merry-go-round in the universe. And um, we really don't exist. Think about the causality. <laughs> but there is a problem with the origin. We have a chemical soup four and a half billion years ago. This presumably gave an RNA world, proteins of DNA, our last ancestor. And this is the bottleneck that we can't get beyond. And then I can see that then we get evolution and then you have a white tie. <laughs> so, so, so evolution is a biological thing, we are told. It's not a chemical thing. And I guess that is a very interesting question about the nature of how chemistry got to biology. We just don't know because we can't see back because our telescope is stopped. This is why it's easier to come up with the origin of the universe because you just put a, just, it's quite hard. You just look into the universe, c collect light and go, oh yes, of course that galaxy is moving away and because they're moving away we draw a point. Yes, and we started there. You can't do that. Oh, probably you can't do that in cosmology as well, and there's another event we can't see. But at least we have a model. We don't even have a model. And that's the key point I want you to take away from this. There is no model yet that gets us from something, from nothing to something. There's, of course, the RNA world. RNA is this fantastic molecule that makes itself, can catalyze reactions, and just basically starts life. But the problem with this is, we almost have to go back to my probability argument. You have to have a lot of RNA arising somewhere, and it takes time. And I think we can prove that life had to arise in a few years. In fact, I think you can make life in a few hours. And there are really sound reasons for that crazy, seemingly, uh, uh, assumption. There's a lipid world where lipids spontaneously form into cells, and these cells then accumulate some complex chemistry and then boom you have a living thing but that's not very satisfactory either there's also the inorganic world which we'll talk about where you just have minerals growing things these are actually tubes I've grown in my lab they look very lifelike but then they're, they're all inorganic they're just whiskers going out of crystals 
And so there are lots of different suggestions. So my suggestion of the inorganic world doesn't stand alone. There are lots of other ideas. And one thing I, I, I don't want to necessarily apologize for, but I want to acknowledge, it, there is a vast um, uh, um, literature in primordial chemistry, a vast set of ideas going right back to Operan, Halliday, Miller and Urey that we'll talk a little bit about. But they all made one assumption, that life was based on carbon. Wrong. They're wrong. And I'll tell you why. The emergence of life was fast. And this is the key. You see, this is almost like these, uh, uh, um, you know, you can take this drug, it's going to cure everything, but do read the small print. But the emergence of life is fast. If the emergence of life is fast, then probably it couldn't have been based upon carbon, because carbon's pretty slow. And there is a reason why carbon's slow that I'll explain. But we need a maximum of 500 million years for the first cell. Um, but the time scale for chemistry, most chemical reactions I know is milliseconds to hours, even with pretty slow carbon reactions. Um, but if we're thinking about evolution as a driving force for life, this rapidly changing environment means that replicator stability has to be found or established within hours. Now there's a word I'm using there, replicator stability, and I'll talk about what I mean by replicator. And in fact, what I'm going to do over the next 45 minutes is just give you the recipe for life, and then I'm going to tell you a secret about the way we're trying to make it in the lab, and then open to questions for your opinion. And I will kind of try and make a, a gesture to the, to the camera that this bit's not to be put anywhere near the world yet, because it's a secret between us. Now, here is the, once the conditions were right, and you're saying, oh, that's a cop-out. I'm not saying no. Imagine, I don't know, a, a table that you're tilting with some water on it and some sand. And you, or, or imagine, maybe more realistically, one of those games where you've got some ball bearings and you're trying to get them through the holes in the maze. And once you've learned how to do it, you can do it in seconds. But if you're going to just do it randomly, it could take hundreds of hours ran randomly, i.e. my son, before he'd worked out that was the answer, and myself doing it. <laughs> Probably the other way around. But <laughs> so... I guess what I'm trying to say is that the emergence of this, um, this system, this first living system, could take hours. And what we're trying to do in the lab is actually come up with a way of screening the possibilities that, that maybe took 100 million years in a few hours. Before we go there, we, I just want to show you the tree of life where we have some kind of our ancestor down here, and we go up through bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And I guess. This, this persistence of this tree of life in biology leads virtually everyone to conclude that we do have a common ancestor. But actually, if my theory is right, you may not need it. I'll give you the first hint for the evening. It could be that life on planet Earth is the perfect expression of the chemistry set available at the time where life was emerging. Now everyone would say, well, I've looked at my mitochondrial DNA and we're all related. Well, that's, that's provable to a degree, but actually there are issues with statistics there that may allow us to find creatures that may not all be descended from exactly the same uh, um, piece of DNA, that the last common ancestor may be few, and we just all zoomed in on four base pairs. Wouldn't that be amazing if actually on planet Earth the convergence to our biology is the answer for life on planet Earth? And that is, a, that is a point that I want to try and make. So how do we get there, and what do I mean by life? And I'm going to keep talking about this minimal Darwinian evolutionary system. Why is it important? important? Well, life, I would suggest, is only about replication in a Darwinian sense. So what is Darwinian evolution? You have an object, it replicates. The offspring from that object compete in an environment. They either persist or they die. They either exist, or they're eaten, or they get taken out of the, the system. When they then go on, and they then replicate, they may mutate. And that mutation, that error, can be copied. And that copying, we will talk about. Because that process allows it to accumulate information. Just in the way you try and tell your children to watch both ways before they cross the road, and do all sorts of other things. You try and give them information to be fitter in the environment. That's the biological equivalent. Darwinian evolution allows you to accumulate information about the environment. So life is, well, it arises in a system energy source, reactive building blocks. 
It's a symmetry breaking process to lead to leads more specialized processes, but probably more importantly, it's a cooperative process emerging leading to spatially and temporally correlated events, interconnected networks dependent on others. It's like the European Union. It's like you have one, or a legal system. It's like interdependent features that are built upon one another. You have baggage built upon baggage. So what is evolution? What are the observations we can make? It's a gradual development of something simple to more complex form. I get, I'll walk over here and try not to fall off. So if you look up there, that's Charles Babbage's counting machine. That's a typewriter. This is one of my favorite personal computers in the UK, the ZX Spectrum. This is a Toshiba laptop. This is a Dell laptop. Anyone know what that is? Macintosh? It's a black and white iPad. <laughs> it is the, for me, it's the top of the evolutionary tree in personal computing right now. So now, of course, they're not linked to each other by biology, but they're linked to each other by the transistor, and they're linked to each other by the desire for the consumer to buy them. And so this is kind of a metaphorical evolution. But also, it's a process by which matter becomes more complex, and you have survival of the fittest. But it requires a body, information, and environment. And the body can either survive or die in the environment. Morphological, chemical persistence, if you don't like life. So it's a thing that can exist. So, what, so it's getting late, and there's a, the, ke the really cool chemistry is to come. So I, what, what I want you to have in your mind at this point is that life doesn't necessarily need to be based upon carbon. And that perhaps life is better defined by the, ab the ability just to, do it, to evolve. And that evolve requires stop go in the transmission of information, Those informa that information must be carried in a, in a molecule of some description. And so in biology, we know we have RNA and DNA. The question really is, what molecule of chemistry can we get? And I already showed you part of the answer with this wonderful, strange-looking ring stripe cluster. So evolution is the driving force. It is the process by which that we are, we are here. So how can we engineer evolution in the chemical world? And so we take our inspiration from biology, and we need to establish the competition. So in my lab, we're trying to set up a situation where we have molecules competing with each other. Again, I don't want to get into a religious. We have to then do some design, and then some system design. And the key thing at the end is we have selection, because of course there is selection going on in evolution. So the emergence of life perhaps is a question of scale, the planet became alive, but what about if we think about the ocean, this pond, the beaker, the test tube, the oil droplet, and the cell? What is the relationship between these scales, and how can we use them to find life in the lab? Because what I'm trying to point out here is a, a way of actually coming up with life in the lab. What I'm suggesting is nothing less than going into my lab one day, doing the chemistry, and a cell coming out the next. So how do we do this? Well, Miller-Urey, well, uh, in 1953, had their famous experiment where they had their bell jar, they had a reducing atmosphere with the components for amino acids, they boiled it for three days. In fact, they were so excited, they stopped it after just three days, and they found amino acids. That is still an amazing experiment. It's really obvious, as my son would tell me when I tell him something profound. <laughs> it's really obvious, but it wasn't obvious at the time that chemistry could give amino acids. And so what we're trying to do in my lab right now is trying to network different reactions together to try and establish this living dynamic. And what we're trying to do is take systems that are complex, spatially, this is a BZ reaction in a Petri dish. You can see the swirls. This is a, a very complex chemical system um, giving rise to oscillations. This is something that we discovered in my lab as well. If you look at the screen here, these are crystals where we've just sprinkled some salt on like salt you'd put on fish and chips. But something very odd is happening. These crystals in real time are, are growing these, these, these tubes that you can see quite fast. And this has really fr fascinated the PhD students that something dead like a crystal could suddenly start to grow these fibers that could go all over. And these fibers are hollow and they sustain themselves. So this is a crystal that's growing this inorganic tube. The molecules are firing out here. To prove that, if we cut the tube with a manipulator, it grows again. And, and if we break it here, if you look carefully, right, look at this, we break it here, it stops. And the pressure is relieved here. 
that this chemistry has been refabricated in real time. Now what I'm going to try and do is now set up the chemistry set and make the links. So we're going to try and make our life, or attempt to make life, based on molybdenum oxide. This is made out of molybdenum oxide, and I'll explain why it's good. When we do this, we want to kind of say, well, we're trying to build a bridge between chemistry and biology, that we're going from life to simple life through some magic. So magic is here, evolution is here. What is that magic? What is the gap between non-life and, and simple life? Well, we need to make cells. And this is because cells allow us to keep stuff inside. We have all this thing, information, metabolism, energy, replication, distribution. But really, it's late. We all know what a cell is. But also, in that cell, we need to somehow put in a molecular network, take a bunch of molecules that interact with each other and put them inside and get them to interact. We need to understand the energies required. We need to understand the molecules that are reacting with each other. And we need to understand these words, catalysis, autocatalysis, and replication. Well, someone that's able to make, to, to make something really fast is a bit like a catalyst. If they can make it really, really fast, in fact, the more things they make, the, far, the better they get of it. It's a bit like a banker, then they're autocatalytic. Um, and there's nothing against bankers, just they're very good at making money, some of them. <laughs> but we need a system level response, so we need some kind of emergence. Now, rather than giving you the set theory, because it is late, here you can see molecule A, molecule B, molecule AB, different combinations. If all these molecules can exchange the A's and the B's, can you see that you can make a quite advanced little network without very much stress? You just need two things and you need to be able to get them to link together. This is called an autocatalytic set. Or for you, or for me actually, this is called a Ponzi scheme. But, well, <laughs> <laughs> now the reason why it's a bit of a Ponzi scheme is it's because there's replication built upon the, the emergence of some dynamic comes as a result of the things within that dynamic. And if you withdraw, withdrew all the building blocks and all the matter, that dynamic would not occur. And so that needs replication. Now, this is really the hub of the story. Everything else from here is about establishing the dynamics I've talked about. So if you're tired, it's all downhill from here. It's going to get fascinating chemically. So replication is important. Now, I would ask you to think about how do you keep your photographs safe at the moment, your digital photographs? Do you store them on tape? I have a thing. I have some tape. I also have one of these optical discs. Do you remember these optical discs you record thing on? How many people here still have an, an optical disc drive, you know, with, to write on it? I guess no, some of you. But I bet you really just have them on hard disk. And the way I keep my data safe now is I copy it from disk to disk to disk. I'm copying all the time. Biology knew this already. If you want to keep pro really interesting data in play, you don't store it. You copy it. And you copy it as fast as you jolly well can and you have copies everywhere. And you don't care if you're going to lose some of it because you've got copies, and you've got copies of copies of copies, just like this thing called the internet. And, and actually, having lots of copies is important. And so in molecules, we can, we can get two molecules coming together where they make a bond there, and they can actually help replicate themselves and make lots of themselves because they are complement. Now, this replication, this copying, we like by copying our photographs because we don't have any noise. But what we really need in biology is we need some kind of polymer replication and then we need to build in an error. Can you see here the error? And that error is then propagated. So you go from here to here. This is Darwinian evolution. And if I can build this in my lab, I suggest to you that I would have made life. Now that is the secret, I think. It's pretty hard to do without going back to DNA, because what could you imagine do this? I'm very good at doing this. Chemists can do this already, but we can't do this. And this doesn't allow us to accumulate information from the environment. And this is akin to copying your photographs and allowing errors to happen. You don't want that. You want a nice high fidelity. Biology doesn't want high fidelity all the time. It only wants it some of the time. So what are the requirements for our living system? We need genetic code. We need mating, we need metabolism, we need adaptation, we need homeostasis. And we can build a system, and we can, I can show you a flowchart. 
rather than showing you a flow chart, I want to kind of talk about the candidates we need for life and actually show you some evolution engineered in process. Um, but what candidates will we choose? Well, we'll, we'll choose polymers, but inorganic polymers. We'll choose ones that, have, that are like amino acids, that we can have growth processes, and we can have the right time scale for making the bonds. So rather than have it showing you the words, I'll show you the molecules. So these molecules are all based on molybdenum oxide. Here it goes. Here are the amino acids. And if you join these together, and we've been doing in my lab, just like Lego, you can make a large variety of nanomolecules. And these are all different shapes and sizes. And forgive me for not explaining them to you in detail. They're a bit boring, actually. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all, a bit like proteins. But for the protein crystallographer or the structural biologist, they're incredibly interesting because they have a given structure and function. Now, the thing I want to say here is you can see all the colors are conserved throughout most of the objects. And that's because they're the same building blocks. So the same small library can make an almost infinite variety of molecules. This molecule here is the size of hemoglobin. This molecule here is a bit bigger. So these are nano-sized molecules that I can make in my lab in a few seconds by getting the pH right. So I just do a bit of cooking. But they're all made from the same building blocks. And when I realized that one recipe could make this molecule, another recipe could make this molecule, but they had the same building blocks, I wondered if I could interconvert them. And if I could interconvert them, could I do it in a Darwinian way? So to do that, we wanted to establish a molecular network of these molecules all together to try and link them. And this one is a particularly fascinating one because this molecule makes this molecule. And it's, I've shown you that in the templating when we were talking about creationism earlier. And also this molecule is like a, a, a template can make this molecule. And together they can replicate each other. But if I took out some of these red bits and made a defect, could I replicate it with the defect? Could I make it Darwinian? That's okay, but how could we engineer an evolvable system? Well, first of all, I want to play God. So what I'm going to do is make a system in which I do evolution by looking and just kicking them out. It's cheating because I'm made by evolution and I'm making an artificial system which I'm evolving by looking. It's cheating because it's not minimal that I'm doing it. I just want to make that point. But let's do it anyway because it's fun. So in go the building blocks. We ask a question about selection. Are you red? No. Let's try again. Yes, you're red now. We'll keep you. This is kind of evolution, you know, kind of deity style. You're looking down, you're doing it, you're selecting. Molecular biologists do this. People do it to select for particular things that they want, drug resistance or engineering new drugs. So you can do this in a bottle. Could we then do it in the lab? Now, this is the only chemistry experiment I'm going to force you to pay attention to, but it's going to make it easy. I have this brown ball here made at pH 4. So brown, pH 4. Blue, pH 1.5. So I want to see if what I can do if I build a computer, and I don't tell the computer the recipe, but I give it an evolutionary algorithm. Now here, we, here we've done, we've done 6 hours of footage split, spliced, you'll be happy to know. You can see the color of this? What color is that? kind of brown. And this color here is blue. And actually, the computer was able to surf through the network and find the ball and the wheel without any student. The student was drinking coffee. They just pressed the button, and they used this evolutionary algorithm. So we did this top down in the lab. So this is cheating. But could we go bottom up? How could we go bottom up? How could we build in a, how could we have the complex molecules, the metabolism, the self-templating, and the bounded chemical containers and the ability to compete. Well, what we needed to do was embed different networks and have a gener different mo molecules with, say, two building blocks at generation one, three building blocks at generation two, and so on, where we could have this um, crossbreeding. So we take the polymers, mix them together, comp competition, propagation. And the idea is that we would see a kind of evolvable material process going on. Um, by doing this in the lab, we, what we were able to do is start off a number of reactions at the same time. So let's just say we started reaction one, and it's a bit really like cooking. 
So if you like to cook a particular flavour soup and you make tomato soup, but then you say, oh, well, I want vegetable soup, and you start cooking your vegetable soup over there, what we actually start to do is move the vegetable soup in the tomato soup, but the vegetable soup conquers the tomato soup and makes vegetable soup mark two because the information from the soups gets mixed. And this is what we're doing here, and I'll show you this in a rather more... Now, I'll skip this because this is just... This is just nano fantasy land. And I'll show you. Here we have our first soup, our building blocks. And they make this molecule. But then we get this molecule if we have these building blocks and this template. Can you see the relationship? Can you see they look similar? And we carry on. And what I'm showing you now is the first example, I think, of molecular evolution in a flask. Can you see the, the DNA, this template, the square thing here? It's rotated here, it's not rotated here, it's hybrided here. And if we did each, any of these reactions, we made any of these soups, and we didn't put the soup in before, you'd just get that. So if you just get that, you need to put it back in itself with this to make that, back in itself to make that. So it's like a dependency. It, each one grows. So to make that simple, here is the, the inorganic genetic phylogenetic tree that we make, and this for me, is really exciting. Because as a function of time, I can show that this is my kind of your building blocks of life, if you like, analogy in the inorganic world, um, uh, and then the different branches off the tree of that life coming out. So we've started to make this network. But that's not good enough. That's just a structural similarity. But I hope you can see that, that there is a relationship in the, by the pictures. That you can see these square things and how this thing at least graphically, looks similar to this one. There's two of those together, can you see? And this one is expanded out. And this one's a defect one. Can you see? It's not so pleasing to the eye. It's, a bit, it's got a bit of a lumpy bit over there. So that's kind of, you know, I don't know what would make the analogy. I have to be very careful if I say it's like I could do it at football teams in Scotland and then I would get, it'd be okay. So now if I could tell you, this is where it gets really interesting. The fact you're awake is great. <laughs> I'm now going to show you how we take these molecules and when we put them at, a water, at an interface, something really strange happens. So we're squirting in the molybdate, the same stuff that makes the molecules before, makes cells. And actually we can put stuff in the cell and do reactions in the cell. And these reactions, are, these cells are pretty good containers. If you look here, we're going to put some base and the base goes through the cell wall and causes a precipitation basically stuff to fall out of the solution inside the cell. But if we increase the size of the base, if we make the molecule bigger, it doesn't get through the cell. So we're able to take the same molecules that make themselves, like the ring and the network, and make cells out of the same molecules. Everything is minimal. It's all come back from molybdenum. So from molybdenum oxide, we can get all these levels of features that remind us of biology. This is what they look like. Here is a physical, so you can see there's a real barrier there. You can see we have some acid above here with an indicator and a barrier, the cell, the, the membrane, and a clear solution through there. And after a few hours, what happens? We can even make them like you would uh, using, a, using a special device, so we're not just using an injector, that they can be made autonomously by squirting through a small nozzle, almost like a gap in some sand. Here they are. Now, here's a wonderful thing. When you shine light on them, they go blue. So when you shine light on them, these things are able to charge up like batteries. Um, and they do a reaction. This reaction is responsible for all our fossil fuel. It's called water splitting. And these, these cells also do water splitting. So again, we have a molecular network that's made out of molybdenum oxide, the deadest thing you can imagine. We can see its te self-template, we can see a genetic um, engineering occurring, and we can make cells out of them, and they can harvest light. So things are getting pretty exciting in terms of, there's something still missing. And what we can also do to these molecules is they can, again, this is the same, there's nothing new here, it's just lived in oxide, but this one is a smaller version, and it, it can basically, I'm going to have to use the Glasgow and Rangers because I don't know any baseball teams around here, I'm sorry. But it can change team. 
by changing the guest on the inside, and this happens spontaneously. The outside is the same, but the inside changes as a function of the metabolism. And this same thing could make a blue cell or a green cell. And the only difference is this small little additive in the middle. And so this allows us to start setting up the recipe to create an organic life. We need a metabolism, we need containers, we need information, and we need evolution. And this is the missing link. This is why this is work in progress. How do we get e evolution? So to do this, we've got our amino acids, we've got cluster translation, we've got, they can, we can charge them up like a battery, we've got reactions where they can make themselves in containers. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you, and this is the thing that I'm going to make the magic wave to the camera person and say, please don't broadcast it yet. And I'm going to show you the four experiments we're looking at making in the lab. And this is ongoing at the moment. And, and I, the story is quite nice. I have a pretty large research group. I have 40 people in my group. And I've been, the group has been growing for the last 10 years. And this has been my master plan the whole time. <laughs> Not quite to have 40 people, but um, I wanted to get to a situation where we could look at this area of science. But none of them knew what they were really working on until last year. So I'm like Dr. Evil, you know, I'm going to buy and sitting in the cave, you know. But it wasn't like that. It was because I didn't really think they'd take it seriously. And I, I didn't want to really risk their careers on some crazy professor trying to make life. And so they all have day jobs, but they all, all these day jobs are convergent technologies. So I, I'm doing what the funders ask, don't worry, I'm not running off with the money because I have some NSF grants or actually the UK has given me money because the NSF has given me money. And so they're partnered up quite nicely. But they all have a secondary expertise that works together. And it's coming through in these, in these, la in these experiments. And I'm going to tell you about what they're doing. So there are four experiments. Um, one is called Life in 5,000 Hours. One is rather um, modestly called Miller Urey to Cronin. <laughs> the other one's called Inorganic Chemical Cells. And the other one is called Evolutionary Emergence. And how we did this, actually, is we, ha we had a, once that I gave the TED talk, they realized the cat was out of the bag. So I gave a 15-minute version of this, a pop science version, where I kind of glossed over the detail and said, wouldn't it be cool to turn metal into living stuff? And everyone went, yes, how? And so this is kind of how we're going to do it. In the lab, we've been do the, the trick is to do lots of chemistry in different spaces. It seems kind of obvious, but we've never done it before. Chemists normally pick up their beaker, <coughs> unless you're watching Fringe or whatever wonderful program you have, and, you've got, and you do your chemistry in a single beaker. What about if you do the same chemistry in multiple beakers at the same time and mix them together, and you have your building blocks in different stages of reaction? It's almost like making several Lego kits and then ramming them from one flask to the other and seeing what happens. And this could simulate what was going on on planet Earth with the tide, or with some evaporation, or with some oscill oscillatory change. And that's important. This has to be at least imaginable on planet Earth. Um, now, this is not imaginable on planet Earth without me, but the flasks, the regions, the chemistry going on. So this is the, this is the Life in 5,000 Hours experiment. And what we're trying to do is take these building blocks and engineer a network which can replicate in 5,000 hours. And this uses the chemistry from before. Now, this experiment is actually extended in a moment, but I'll now get, get, get next to my hedging my bets experiment, where I had an argument with the RNA world. And the RNA world said you know, that I was being too arrogant, that l carbon was, was immaterial. And I thought, maybe you're right. What is wrong with the Miller-Urey experiment? The thing that's wrong with the Miller-Urey experiment is there's no Earth's crust in it. No Earth's crust at all. It's just methane, um, some water, some ammonia, some spark, and there's no sand, no iron, nothing. So we've rebuilt the Miller-Urey experiment, but we've got four worlds. We have a phosphate world, we have a calcium hydroxide world, and we have a silica world, and we, we have an um, a, a iron pyrite world. I remembered them. Phew. Phosphate for the phosphorus for your RNA. Calcium hydroxide, because calcium hydroxide makes sugars. Silica, because we want some sand and some filtering. And iron pyrite, because it's 
standard, standard and it acts like a battery. So no one's done this experiment. No one has done this experiment because there isn't the chemical engineering and the computer control available when the Miller, Miller Urey experiment was done. And now in my lab, all we've done is we've built a computer controlled system where we can systematically move the contents of these flasks around. And it, no one understood that the Darwinian replicator is going to be really efficient. Everyone thought this is ludicrous. You could do this, but you'd have to go away for 100 million years. If there's a Darwinian replicator in there, it will take less than three weeks. So th that's kind of interesting. So um, that's one experiment. The other one is these inorganic cells. We're putting together all the building blocks we've seen before, and we're passing them through these microfluid devices, and we're trying to engineer the, some evolution. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, this is really getting to the lot. Here you can see some droplets being fused together, and here you can see some droplets being split up. Now, this is rather analogous to combining DNA and this is analogous to splitting it apart. If we can surf through many different possibilities, we should be able to engineer um, a fusion and defusion rather like a, a, a birth and death process. So this brings us really to the, the last couple of slides of the talk, this universal definition of life, and I'll give you what my, I think my theory of evolution is and how, we're gonna, and how it all fits together. So the universal definition of life is matter that evolves in a minimal way. And the consequence of this is it will allow you to have a general theory of evolution that you can design by evolution with all matter. And then we start to move from the selfish gene to selfish matter. You know, what is it about um, the matter that's in biology that makes it more selfish than the matter in your chair? Well, the matter in your chair is not very successful. Will this lead to, lead to new technology? Can we make inorganic life modules? Can we use the evolvable matter in the environment to self-repair, make new machines? Can we take life apps where we actually e co-evolve through different environments? So we use software to engineer that evolution, and at the end, we can then program using an app to make the, the, the living um, material more useful. So what would it look like? This is the final kind of movie. You can, might recognize some of the molecules here. Look carefully. That just made that. The wheel is now here making the template. And they're all flowing around in a beaker. But what you really need to happen is this sophisticated chemistry to encapsulate itself in a membrane. Where people failed before is the membrane had to be added. But these molecules make their own membranes. Now we need them to form different teams. And then the scary bit, the bit that we want to discuss, is once they've all bogged off, what happens to the planet? So the group is assembled around these four areas, making molecules, making hybrid molecules, making synthetic systems, and looking at the term inorganic biology. And this comes to the theory of evolution that we have. And it's really simple, that there is a minimal chemistry set in the periodic table that allows you to form sophisticated molecules that um, can compete and do exactly what you've seen there. But they can't get past a certain level of evolution. They keep dying when they get to maybe when the temperature goes up or something falls out of the natural uh, boundary for persistence. But we already know there's these things called amino acids. And let's just say every time the cell divides, two amino acids were joined together just randomly, a product of that cell division and some chemistry that we're testing now. It only takes 15 generations for you to have a protein with 15 amino acids. Then suddenly that cell has a protein in it. And if that protein has some function, that cell can persist better than the other cell. And so it goes like this, I think. Inorganic matter, minimal cell, proteins, RNA, DNA, the last common ancestor. And that's what we're trying to prove in the lab at the moment. And, that's the, and that throws current dogma on its head, because everyone thinks that RNA came first. This is the team that are helping me do this. I'm very fortunate to have a huge bunch of people, 15 postdocs, 22 PhD students, three research fellows, a technician, um, um, and uh, a bunch of co-workers, permanent co-workers that are in helping us in the University of Glasgow. This is a really interesting ride we're on at the moment because we're really challenging all sorts of technological and ethical issues, not just about the science, 
So, um, and I hope I've convinced you that we're not trying to do Frankenstein science. Um, and I think I should finish there and, and conclude by thanking the society and thanking you so very much. allows us to start to this Friday evening. Thank you.